A new poll highlights how getting more people to the polls could boost the chances of Beto O'Rourke in the race for governor. The Marist Texas poll asked registered voters who they would choose in next month's election. The results put Governor Abbott on top by a four-point margin over O'Rourke. That's within the poll's margin of error, but it's a different story when the poll narrows down to those who say they definitely plan to vote. Those numbers show Abbott winning 52 percent support, eight points ahead of O'Rourke. Because of the sizable registration advantage in Texas, it doesn't matter that O'Rourke's winning among independents and Democrats. He's losing big among Republicans, and there's more Republicans than anybody else in, in Texas. The poll found that neither candidate is particularly popular among voters. 46% of Texans said they had an unfavorable view of Greg Abbott, while 44% had an unfavorable opinion about O'Rourke. But beyond the race for governor, you need to be ready to make decisions on dozens of races you'll see on the ballot when you vote. And races like school board trustees, commissioners, and county judges matter more than you think. Daniel Manning digs into why it's more important than ever to know about those down ballot candidates. Maybe this has happened to you before. It's election day and you get to the voting machine and you know who you're going to vote for for the bigger races. But then you get down to the bottom of your ballot and you think to yourself, hmm, I'm not really sure who these candidates are. Well, we came to UT Austin to learn how to become better informed voters because a lot of those smaller races, well, they have big implications on our daily lives. It's been interesting in that we started our conversation with Jim Henson, director of UT's Texas Politics Project, which tracks state politics and conducts a lot of the polling we report on. I think people Henson touched on the importance of down ballot races like school boards, which have sway over things like curriculum, library books, uh, books in the classroom and county clerks who maintain the voter rolls and then actually op organize and operate elections on election day. But we wanted to drill down a bit more on the why. Why does it matter more than ever to know the candidates in these races that don't get too much attention? It's gotten more complicated in recent years because we are seeing sometimes actors with bad intentions or very narrow interests trying to use these local and very small races to have influence on policies that's probably not reflective of you know, what might happen if we had a broader range of participation. And I think a broader range of participation and more attention to these races helps guard against that. But information about those races, you know, still takes some effort. Henson has a couple of suggestions on researching these candidates. He says, first off, you can just do a simple internet search. Just make sure that you are linking to reputable websites. Also, there are plenty of civic organizations out there who live for this kind of thing and put out voting guides like the League of Women Voters. And lastly, just check with friends and family. Chances are you might already know somebody who is plugged into the political scene. For those looking to take their research game to the next level, looking up campaign finance records to see who's funding these candidates isn't as hard as you might think. For big statewide races, the Texas Ethics Commission website has an easy to use search feature. City and county filings will be on city and county websites, school board filings on the district websites. Oh, just make sure you're searching a candidate's legal name, not their nickname. Do you see a lot? We also chatted with Amber Mills, advocacy organizer for the nonprofit Move Texas at UT, and she clued us into something pretty interesting happening on social media. Candidates taking to TikTok as a cost effective way to reach younger voters. They're getting on and saying things like, this is what I stand for, and, and making it like fun and easy for voters to understand, especially young voters. Do you think that resonates with young voters? Oh, yeah. Okay, it, uh, they, don't I, see, they don't think it's corny. They, it, it, I think it there is a level, like there's a fine line where it can be corny, but I think all in all, what voters, or especially young voters, are wanting is some sort of like relatability, some sort of like personality that you can't always get from a campaign website. Makes sense. We asked her for more tips to learn about candidates. Mill says a lot of these candidates hold happy hours. Who doesn't like happy hour? You can also attend a candidate forum. Not a lot of people go to those, so it is a good opportunity to get some one-on-one -on -one time with the candidates, or you can just reach out to the candidates directly. Back at the Texas Politics Project, a final question. What is the trick to broadening the appeal or the interest in these races? Do what you're doing now. You have to make an effort to make sure that people see that these races aren't just lines on you know page 10 or 12 of their ballot, that it's something that has a real impact on their community. 
The race for state comptroller doesn't get the attention of higher profile positions in Texas. It's the person in charge of collecting taxes for the state and letting lawmakers know how much money the state has to spend. Capital correspondent Monica Madden highlights the candidates in this key race. The race for Texas controller might not seem like the most exciting, but it's a powerful position. Managing the state's multi-billion dollar budget, collecting taxes, and writing the checks. Republican incumbent Glenn Hagar says he'll keep Texas on economic track if re-elected. Important that we continue to be on the trajectory of economic opportunity and economic development for people of the state of Texas. In his bid for a third term, Hagar is also promising to prioritize broadband expansion. Seven million people across the state of Texas that have have no internet connectivity. He faces a challenge from Democrat Janet Dudding, a longtime CPA. 35 years, my whole adult life, I've been a governmental accountant. Dudding wants to revamp the office, saying she does not think Hagar is making the best use of Texans' taxes. We've got the second largest economy in the nation, and yet we're 45th in public ed, 43rd in public health, 41st in air and water quality. It's not up to the controller to decide how to spend the state's money, but he or she can make recommendations to the legislature. What are the most immediate issues we need to address? What are the longer term issues we need to address? And what is the trajectory of the state economy? This is our shot to take advantage of what's coming down from, from the, the federal government and to really expand services. Hagar has talked about the need for infrastructure investments. Dudding lists the importance of addressing climate change and Medicaid expansion. Monica Madden, State of Texas. There is a third candidate on the ballot. Alonzo Echeverria Garza is running as a libertarian. He did not have a campaign website and we were not able to reach him. The race for Texas Land Commissioner, it's on the ballot, but do you know what that job entails? You will in a few moments, and you'll hear from the Texans whose names will appear on your ballot.